uh, February 9th meeting of the Mining and Forestry Policy Committee. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the mining permitting process and overview. We're going to have uh, the DNR come in to talk to us and we're also going to have the Pollution Control Agency talk to us about kind of what it takes for a, a permit to happen in Minnesota. So just kind of an overview so we as committee members all have a better understanding of what it takes and what these entities actually go through to get to that point to actually have a permit. Uh, the first one we have up today uh, is Mr. Joe Henderson from the DNR. So we'll hear from the DNR first. Um, like before, we'll after the DNR is done, then we'll take some questions from members. And after the PCA is done, then we'll open up for questions again there. Uh, but I'll hand it over to Mr. Henderson. Just state your name for the record and looking forward to hearing your presentation, Mr. Henderson. Okay, I trust everyone can hear me. Good afternoon, uh, Senators, Chairman Eichhorn. I'm Joe Henderson, uh, Division Director for the Division of Lands and Minerals at the Minnesota DNR. Uh, I'm glad to be here virtually with you today. Uh, I'll be presenting uh, on an overview of the DNR's role in my per mine permitting. There we go. I think Megan's going to drive for me. Here we go. Um, fantastic. It looks like it's a little big on my screen. I don't know if you can shrink it, but anyways. Um, so uh, I believe following me, the PCA will, will then discuss per their permitting role for the same industry. Um, this is going to be a review for some of you, but bear with me. I'm going to try and uh, keep the talk moving right along. Uh, as we discussed a couple weeks ago when I presented here, uh, Minnesota has world-class parks, lakes, rivers, forests, and we also have world-class mineral deposits. The process of permitting a mine in Minnesota involves as we talked about before, compliance with strong environmental laws, the rigorous science-based technical review of applications by state experts, a transparent public process, and the opportunity for public input, and if permitted, the ongoing review of amendments and compliance with laws and permit conditions covering mine operations, maintenance, and the eventual closure and full site reclamation. The pictures that you're gonna see on my slides are all mines here in Minnesota. This is Hill Annex, um, now a state park. Next slide, Megan. I propose to walk you through the DNR's role in mine permitting, starting with environmental review. Even though the focus here today is permitting, I felt I would start with a few slides on environmental review. You can clearly spend a whole educational hearing on environmental review in the future. Uh, I will then move to DNR permitting, including water appropriation, work in public waters, dam safety, and the permit to mine. I'll include a focus on waste characterization and financial assurance. In the interest of time, this talk is going to focus on ferrous or taconite and non-ferrous mining. Remember from last time we talked that the DNR also works on non-metallic and industrial minerals, including peat, dimension stone, crushed stone, aggregate, and sand. Um, also, I have to maybe start with a caveat that I'm not an attorney. I tried to capture some legal specifics here during the talk. I think I'm correct, but again, I didn't run this through legal. Next slide, Megan. When talking about mine permitting, you have to start with an understanding of whether environmental review is gonna be required. The Minnesota Environmental Policy Act, or MEPA, requires that an environmental impact statement, or EIS, be conducted for all new mining operations. A new mine can be a new operation, or it can also be a new pit at an existing mine. The DNR is often the responsible government unit, or RGU. The RGU is the lead regulatory agency for environmental review. It can be singular, like the DNR, or the PCA, or the county. Um, when a project does involve some key federal program, you can also have joint federal and state environmental review, such as with Polymet, we were joint with the Army Corps of Engineers, or currently in Twin Metal, where you have a federal mineral estate as well as a state and private mineral estate, we're working alongside the Bureau of Land Management. We also work with tribal governments on mining environmental review. Next slide. Very simplified, there are two levels of environmental review, each with distinct criteria in MEPA. There's the Environmental Assessment Worksheet, or the EAW. This is a six-page worksheet with 31 standardized questions. It contains information about a project description, environmental setting, potential environmental impacts, and mitigation measure, measures. By statute, it's designed to be a brief document and disclose information necessary 
necessary to decide if an environmental impact statement would be needed. In practice, over time, this is not necessarily a brief document anymore. For mining, a mandatory EAW is triggered for mineral deposit evaluation of deposits other than natural iron ore or taconite. This is also called a bulk sample, if you may have heard that. Uh, we've probably done two or three of these at the DNR in the past 20 years. It's also triggered for an expansion of a stockpile tailings basin or mine by more than 320 acres. It's triggered by a 25% or more expansion of a plant. In addition to the EAW, there's also an environmental impact statement or the EIS. This is a much more detailed, extensive document that includes a project description, alternatives for sites, technologies, modified design, modified scale. It compares environmental, economic, and social impacts. It looks at mitigation of impacts. And EIS includes also a scoping process, which is called the scoping EAW, which is intended to focus the EIS on information essential, essential to inform permitting decisions. For mining, a mandatory EI, the mandatory EIS triggers include a mineral deposit evaluation of 1,000 tons or more of radioactive material. This has never been done in the state of Minnesota. For construction of a new tailings basin for a metallic mineral mine, for construction of a new metallic mineral processing facility. There's also the possibility of a discretionary EAW or EIS. Discretionary occurs when a governmental unit with approval authority or a proposer believes that there could be a potential for significant environmental impacts. Final agency decisions on both an EAW and EIS are appealable within 30 days from the decision's publication in the EQB monitor. The appeal would be to the Minnesota Court of Appeals. Environmental review is, a very, is very broad and can cover many topics. It's important to understand what it does as well as what it doesn't do. Environmental review helps permit approval decision makers understand the environmental and socioeconomic impacts of a proposed project. It takes a hard look at the project for potential significant impacts using the best available data. It explores ways to avoid, minimize, or mitigate potential environmental impacts through alternates in design, technologies, or practices. It gives the public early access to decision makers with multiple opportunities for input. So there is a public notice and a public meeting during the scoping process. There's a public notice and public meeting for the draft environmental impact statement. There's a public notice for the final EIS and there's a public notice for the adequacy determination. Note that environmental review laws prohibit issuance of final permits until the environmental review process is complete. Some things that environmental review doesn't do. I think we need to go back one. Yep, thank you. Things that environmental review doesn't do. It doesn't approve or deny a proposed project. It doesn't guarantee that permits can be issued for a project. It doesn't analyze every conceivable impact from a project. It doesn't answer every and all question for a project. But if a project meets state environmental review requirements, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will meet permitting requirements. However, a project must meet state environmental review requirements in order for it to ever be permitted. Thank you. Um, again, so all these are pictures, uh, as some of you maybe have been here. This uh, picture, just as we move into permitting now, this is standing atop LTV and their historic tailings basin. You can see the very large reclaimed tailings basin portion um, off to the, to the near and, and uh, to the left side, as well as an unclaimed portion where Polymet would hope to expand their tailings basin there on the right-hand side where you see a little bit of water. So again, on to permitting. So the DNR mine permitting involves permits through both the DNR Lands and Minerals Division and the DNR Ecological and Water Resources Division. Key DNR permits for mining projects typically include water appropriation, public water works, dam safety, and the permit to mine. Each of these permits has its own set of legal requirements for issuance or denial. Each also has an opportunity for appeal. 
We'll look at some specifics for each one of these key mining permits at the DNR. Water appropriation permits. These are the DNR permits to manage water resources, surface and groundwater to provide for reasonable use while ensuring long-term sustainability of the natural and, and natural resource protection. When establishing permit limits, the DNR must consider the sustainability of the resource, including current and projected water levels, water quality, protection of ecosystems, and the needs of future generations. Work in public waters permit. If a proposed project will affect the course, current, or cross-section of public water, it may re be required to get a public waters work permit. Both of these permits have similar application, review, decision, and appeal processes. So let's answer some simple questions here on this slide um, to help understand key permitting requirements for these two DNR permits. So who gets notice? Water appropriation and public water work permits have a targeted notice requirement. The applications must undergo a 30-day interagency review period that allows for internal DNR staff, as well as any other local government unit or other agencies that may have jurisdiction, such as the county, the city, the Soil and Water Conservation District, or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They're entitled to review the proposal and provide comments to the DNR. Is there a public meeting? There is no public meeting, but there is a public hearing requirement, which is often waived by the DNR commissioner. Is there tribal coordination? The DNR mine permitting work is discussed at least quarterly with the tribal environmental staff. If a project is on or adjacent to tribal lands, tribal staff are notified of the 30-day review period and provided the opportunity to review and comment on the project proposal. Is there an appeal process? Minnesota rules allow that the applicant, managers of the watershed district, the soil and water conservation district, water control district board of supervisors, or the mayor of the city may demand a hearing within 30 days after receiving mailed notice of any outlined decision uh, with reasons denying or modifying the application. There's also an opportunity for an appeal to the court of appeals for all final agency decisions. This appeal must be made within 60 days of the final agency decision. Is this process the same for amendments for these two permits as well as new permits? All new permit applications are sent out for the 30-day interagency review as our major permit amendment requests, those that significantly change the project. Minor permit amendments may be done without the full 30-day interagency review. Next slide. Dam safety permits. This program issues and manages permits to regulate the construction, alteration, operation, maintenance, and closure of dams to protect public health, safety, and welfare. This program manages all dams in the state of Minnesota. These permits typically follow the same process as the public waters and, and water appropriation permits. They undergo the targeted 30-day notice to the mayor of the municipality, the secretary of the board of managers of the watershed district, the secretary of the board of supervisors for the soil and water conservation district. Again, there is no public meeting requirement, but there is a public hearing requirement that is often waived. Is there tribal coordination? Again, the DNR mine permitting work is discussed at least quarterly with tribal environmental staff and there has been at least one geotechnical engineering presentation on dam construction and safety given to the tribal environmental staff in recent years. Is there an appeal process? I think we're back, yep, thank you. Is there an appeal process? The local government units can call for a hearing. The demand must be filed within 30 days after a mailed notice of an order and a bond is required. Any appeal would be to uh, a contested case hearing, and it would involve the Office of Administrative Hearings. There's also, again, an opportunity for an appeal to the Court of Appeals for all final agency decisions. This appeal, again, must be made within 60 days of the agency final decision. Is this, the pro is this process for dam safety amendments the same as it is for new permits? Again, all new permit applications are sent out for the 30-day interagency review as our major permit amendment requests, those that significantly would change the project. Minor permit amendments may be done without the full 30-day interagency review. 
permit to mine. The purpose of the permit to mine is to control the possibility of adverse environmental infect effects of mining by ensuring orderly construction and development of a mine, sound operational practices, and the progressive reclamation of mined areas. Something interesting in this picture, you're looking at progressive reclamation at United. What you see across from you on the other side of the pit will at one day be the shores of a lake. The littoral zones and such are being built right now with the understanding that someday they will be underwater and be the shores. Um, the permit to mine is required for both ferrous and non-ferrous projects under the ferrous rules promulgated in 1980 and the non-ferrous rules promulgated in 1993. The permit to mine includes provisions that govern, govern wetland replacement under the Wetland Conservation Act. The goal again is to ensure no net loss of wetlands. Waste characterization is key. It requires work to understand the relative reactivity of materials excavated for mining operations. Uh, that can be waste rock, it can be tails. Uh, financial assurance is key. This is the mine, uh, the permittee money set aside to ensure that sufficient funds for uh, exist for the state to complete reclamation if for any reason the company fails to do so and or complete corrective actions if needed. Next slide. The permit, yep. The permit to mine process includes a required public notice process where the application is advertised in the newspaper for four weeks once per week. For non-ferrous, there's the same four week newspaper notice and it also must be noticed in the EQB monitor and the state register. For both, there's a comment period for 30 days after the last newspaper publication. So virtually you almost have two months of notice. Is there a public meeting required? Non-ferrous permanents have a required public meeting when the application is initially received by the agency. Ferrous permits do not require a public meeting, but we have often held them for proposals. Is there tribal coordination? There is, again, discussion at least quarterly with the tribal environmental staff and for new permits and substantial changes to uh, amendments, advance notice of the publication to the newspaper is given to the tribal governments, as well as nearly final or final applications are sent directly to tribal staff to give them a greater period of time to look at uh, the application if they would choose to comment. Is there an appeal process? Any person owning property that will be affected by the proposed project or any federal or state government having jurisdictional authority over the proposed mining operation may petition for a contested case hearing. There's also the opportunity for an appeal to the Court of Appeals for all final agency decisions. This appeal, again, must be made within 60 days of the agency decision. Would you like me to answer the question right now? All right, thank you. you. you I can, can do that. All right. All you right. can I'll wait till the end, Mr. Henderson. That, that's fine. But yeah, please do answer that when we get into the question period after, after the presentation. Okay. It's, it was just on point right now. All right. Um, you know, uh, is there a pro is the process the same for all amendments and for new permits, right? Uh, it is the same for new permits and substantial change amendments, but not subst non substantial amendments are not noticed. Again, we still talk to the tribes, we still do all of the other work, they do not get noticed for the four weeks. Um, so now, next. Oh, I think we jumped two. Oh, okay, thank you. So um, I'm gonna present a little greater detail on two important components of the permit to mine, which these get a lot of attention, waste characterization and financial assurance. First, waste characterization. Uh, Lands and Minerals has been conducting waste characterization research, including characterization of sulfur containing rocks for over 40 years. This important research is critical in creating data and the science to support environmental review and permitting decisions for regulatory agencies. This geochemical work is key in modeling and predicting potential future impacts. The work is actually started prior to the permit applications ever even coming into the agencies, and the data feeds into the agencies and, and establishing water quality, water monitoring standards, during environmental review and permitting and throughout the life of the permit. 
Next slide. So you've seen some of these pictures the last time I gave a presentation. So ongoing DNR waste characterization research has been an integral part of the DNR's mining program and is widely recognized for its importance to both ferrous and non-ferrous mining. Last time I spoke to you, I invited you each to come to Hibbing to see our core library and our Hibbing lab and our test sites. I do truly hope to see you there this summer. Tests such as these have been running for as long as 40 years. New experiments are started as needed, and we continue to better understand the long-term behavior of waste rock and tailings once disturbed or generated by a mining operation. In the pictures here, you've got both scales. On the left side, we're evaluating the reactions in the labs and rates of mine, rate, mine waste leaching. We, we, we weekly rinse these tails or fine particles with water and we analyze the water over time, right? On the right side, you've got field scale leaching experiments which assist us in understanding the effects of long-term storage in Minnesota's actual climate. You can see that those are on lined basins where we're actually collecting and looking at the water that's generated under those. We get those large uh, you know, samples from actually different operational mines. Next slide. A second hot topic in mine permitting right now is financial assurance. Financial assurance ensures that there is a source of funds to be used by the commissioner if a permittee fails to perform reclamation activities, including closure or post-closure, if operations cease for any reason, and corrective action if non-compliance is, is, uh, occurs with design or operating criteria. The DNR must make an adequacy determination of financial assurance. So we assure that the amount is sufficient to cover reclamation costs, including closure and post-closure maintenance for any commissioner ordered corrective action. We make sure that the funds are payable to the commissioner and available when needed. We assure that the financial assurance is valid, binding and enforceable under law. And we assure that the funds are free from the impact of bankruptcy. Some key elements of management of financial assurance include the permittee must annually review estimates and costs for financial assurance, and the commissioner may hire individuals with financial assurance expertise to advise the DNR. No specific type of financial instrument is mandated, but often we've been actually told that a combination of tools is best, including cash, bonds, and irrevocable letters of credit. The permittee is released only when the site is fully reclaimed. Next slide. So in summary, uh, you heard some of this again last time, our workload is currently very high. Currently we have 29 permit to mine and, and WACA, Wetland Conservation Act amendments in progress and 18 water appropriation amendments. Plus we have the twin metal environmental review. We're currently in the process, hopefully to add a geotechnical engineer. We're gonna have one retire here soon. And uh, we want to bring on some additional wetland expertise also. With steel at a 10-year high, all the mines are fully operational and looking to line up amendments ahead of their future needs. Next slide. So I hope you now have a little bit better understanding uh, of, you know, what we're looking at. You know, remember, environmental review and permitting are complex tasks to protect all the interests and involve coordination between federal, state, and local and tribal governments. We strive for transparent processes that allow for input to agency decisions, and the DNR and state leaders continue to improve coordination and processes to meet new challenges and opportunities. I stand for questions, or we can hand it off to Doug Wetstein to talk about uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency permits. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Uh, we appreciate the presentation and we'll, we will take some DNR questions before switching over to PCA. I see that there was one in the questions. I think maybe you noticed that and that's what you were referencing um, about uh, where, where these notices need to be posted. And if you could expound on that a little bit more, then we'll get into to member questions. Kind of, it sounds like you saw the question. So if you could- I did, just, I did. Uh, That'd be appreciated. So the rules are typically written to focus on the area where the mine, uh, the expansion or the, the, or the amendment or the new permit is. So often we use a, a, a 
what would you say, a newspaper of, of legal notice, right? So if it's near Grand Rapids, we could use Grand Rapids. If it's near Duluth, we could use Duluth. Um, and, and we work with the companies to decide which paper is appropriate because we want to get the message out. Often they can even use more than one paper to ensure that um, they're, they're covering the need that they have. And, and the same is true, for example, for, for public meetings. It may be required within the county in which the mine uh, uh, is being operated, but we have also expanded in other instances to have public meetings at other locations. Thank you for that. And uh, I see Senator Kunish who asked that question has her hand up, but Senator Isaacson had his hand up first. So we'll go to Senator Isaacson first and then uh, Senator Kunish, if, if you would like him to hit on that a little more, certainly feel free to ask him on your questioning. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate it. Uh, a couple of questions for you. Um, one, you said a few times, and please understand this is kind of my first dip into this end of the pool. And so I'm learning as we go here. And, and you said a couple of times that we'll, oftentimes public comment sessions were waived or not done. And I, I'm not sure if I'm using the right word or was it public discussion or something? And I just wanted to know why would they, why wouldn't they be done? And there could be a good reason. I don't know. I'm just wondering what it was. Mr. Henderson. Thank you, Chair and Senators. Uh, that was for water and dam safety permits. There's an opportunity for a hearing and often um, due to lack of interest with the, the targeted right. group, uh, we, the commissioner from the DNR has often waived that hearing with full knowledge that there's another opportunity for those same folks to request a hearing and there's an opportunity for everyone else to appeal the decision if, if desired. Those hearings have been held when we believe that there's a lot of interest locally, but again, often scheduling and, and having a hearing takes a great deal of time. And if there's no, what would you say, the issues that we believe a hearing would help uh, benefit in, in decision makers, they're often waived. That makes sense. Mr. Chair? Senator Isaacson? Yep. So uh, thank you for that. I figured there was probably a reason for it, but I just didn't understand it and I wanted to learn more. Uh, the financial assurance piece, I've heard of this and I've heard people talk a lot about this and I imagine I probably have as much correct information as I do incorrect. So maybe you could help me with this. Um, when you say financial assurance, what you're saying is, is that we ask them to put up X amount of dollars up front that we believe is enough to reclaim this, should they not do the job or so they, I mean, what is the, is it as a guarantee in case they don't do it, we have this money or is it a, uh, um, this is what we use to actually reclaim the land and make it whole again. Mr. Henderson. Chair, Senator. Uh, actually, both are true, right? So okay. we we receive the money. So I can give you the example for Polymet, right? So we have $74, $75 million right now in a combination of tools, some of which would be available immediately. Others may take 30 to 90 days, right? Like bonds to release. Um, but it's all bankruptcy proof. It's all in the name of the DNR commissioner. We have this, the money secure. So what happens is if PolyMet were to move into closure right now, we wouldn't touch that money. That money would sit there and only be released as they did pro progressive closure, right? We always go to the company first. The company always is responsible to do the work. And only if they fail to do the work, would we touch then their financial assurance. And we would cash that then, and we would do the work for them. There's another instance though, where if we ask someone to do some work, because we believe maybe there was a spill or there was something else, mm -hmm. and, and they fail to do the work within a reasonable amount of time, we also can cash their financial assurance, we can do the work, and then we can ask them to up their financial assurance again back to make it whole um, and, and to take care of you know, the new issue as well as the full uh, remaining closure issues if they if they don't step up. Interesting. Mr. Chair? Senator Isaacson? Yep. Thank you. Um, and so uh, how do you, and I, this, this really isn't a loaded question, even though I might sound like one. I just, how do you determine how much you need to guarantee, like, how is that done? I'm, I imagine there's a formula and certain, how does that work? I'm just not familiar with it. Yeah, it, it I'm sorry. Mr. Henderson, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Um, it was actually quite amazing. Uh, a couple of years back, again, I'll use PolyMet as an example. I, I think you heard in my talk, we are allowed to seek uh, outside expertise in this area. And so we actually hired a contractor. 
PolyMet had to pay for us to hire the contractor. We now have that contractor on contract. Every year they look at PolyMet's financial assurance. It's incredibly detailed. It's all about everything from, you know, the cost of, we have to ensure that if they walk away or leave, there's not going to be trucks there. So it includes how much to rent the truck, the employee, you know, the grass seed, everything down to the last right. detail of years of reclamation that it would take to put that site back to, to uh, you know, a reclaimed status where we can close it. And so we have been, you know, very fortunate in that, you know, the rules allow us to bring in those external experts. For taconite mining, we have, you know, much greater expertise on site. We just wanted to make sure we had everything covered. And so every time there's an amendment, you know, we ask for an update in their financial assurance to cover that in incremental increase in what might, you know, be within the new amendment. One last question, sir, and I'm done. Sure. Uh, Senator sure. Isaacson. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to walk me through this. I'm kind of learning as we go here. And and one of the things that I, I've been getting information on is about dams. And and I'm wondering when you guys uh, permit dams, are we? I mean, are we still permitting dams? Like, and how does that work with in comparison to where we're doing tailings and that kind of stuff? And where do you permit them still, or where are you proposing to permit them? If you might, is that still something we're doing? Or, Mr. Henderson, here, senators. Um, yes, we still permit dams. Okay. And um, much of our work at the current tailings basins are raises, right? So the dams continue to go up or they may build a new cell um, on, on an existing dam to take on additional tailings capacity. And so that is traditionally what the dams in Minnesota are built for. And again, mm -hmm. remember Minnesota, much of our landscape is very flat. So mm -hmm. we build a ring dike dam, you know, that's the traditional style for right. tailings management. And, and uh, then as you saw in the one picture I had, um, and again, I, I, I would very much, I know Senator Tomasoni has done this with us. We took, a, we took a, a large coach bus and we drove it up on top of the tailings dam and drove the bus all the way around the top of the tailings dam on what used to be the liquefied tails once they have dried out and, and mm -hmm. the water has has uh, you know dissipated out of the out of the dam, and so um, yes, we still we still uh, permit them, and we there's an annual review of of every operational tailings dam within the state. Um, we have you know uh, excellent geotechnical engineers. As I said, we're looking to bring another one on because sadly, uh, one of ours wants to retire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it happens. And and does that miss want to follow up on that, Mr. Chair? Yep, go ahead, that, Senator Isaacson. Does that include like are there any new proposals for dams anywhere else that we're looking at? And how does that work when you have to do a new one? Because this, this ring concept is interesting to me. I didn't realize that's how that works. I think of a dam as like the Hoover Dam, right? And you're saying there's many different dimensions of that. And so I imagine if you do a, a dam upstream, it has an effect downstream and that kind of stuff. Do we have any in the works right now for that? Mr. Henderson? chairs. Uh, there are expansions to existing dams which have been proposed. The only new dam that we have right now that is in the very, very early, it's in the scoping environmental review process, would be the, the tailings dam that uh, Twin Metals would be proposing. Got it. Cool. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Isaacson. Great questions. Uh, I've got Senator Kunish next, and then after Senator Kunish, I have Senator Tomasoni. Wonderful. Thank you uh, very much. One of my questions, I think it was, let me go back. I think it's slide number six, where you say uh, the environmental review does not do and uh, bullet point three, analyze every conceivable impact from a project. And so um, my, my first question is um, then do you ever, does, in an environmental review, do you ever do a health impact assessment um, to see how, and I'm thinking of it because um, I, I live in New Brighton and we had the munitions factory, you know, uh, plant not too far here that that um, affected the drinking water for our communities in this area. And so um, is 
uh, a health impact assessment one of the things that you always do or you do it sometime um what is what is the protocol for that mr henderson chair senator kunich um so for example again i'll use something recent polymed as an example this was a topic that was discussed at great length for polymed and and so what we looked at were many of the key factors that would be in a health assessment, um, but an actual health assessment, uh, health impact assessment was not done. Currently, for large projects such as Twin Metals, it is yet again something that we're very much talking about. And we have set the expectation that there will be some level of health assessment impact for Twin Metals. Senator Kunish? Yeah, it's follow up. So, um, um, if you, I guess my question is, have you done health impact assessments? And um, if it has showed an overall negative health, uh, a public health impact, uh, would you have recourse or would you have the ability to deny a permit? Mr. Henderson? We're getting into details that are moving further and further away from um, you know, lands and minerals. Uh, the environmental review is is out of ecological and water resources. And again, I would encourage you to bring them in for a full day. Um, but we have not done a full health impact assessment on a mining project right now. And I think that, you know, I don't want to speculate as to, you know, um, I would imagine that, that uh, surely as we look at twin metals and we set the expectation that one will be done, we'll have conversations about what it means also. Thank Senator you. Kunish. I do have a, a, a switch to another question or another topic if I may. Yeah, feel free. So um, I remember reading an article um, coming out of the Duluth News Tribune about mile post seven. And I'm wondering if that's what you were talking about when you're talking about the, the dam. And so when, when, when you are looking at that, and I think they wanted to expand that dam, um, does the DNR have to complete an environmental review of a proposal before issuing a permit that's that's either an expansion or amendment to the existing dam? Mr. Henderson. Thank you, uh, Chair Senator Kunich. Um, so again, um, I think we look at it at each of these uh, instances and, and for milepost seven, there is uh, an EIS that was done, and this is an expansion that was anticipated within that EIS. And we're now looking at that to ensure that the EIS uh, covered you know, all of uh, the requirements that it needed to cover when it was done in the past. And, and is there new information that would substantially change anything? And, and so you are correct. Milepost 7 is looking to expand. This was something that was anticipated in their EIS and was anticipated years ago. And so now they're just looking at uh, uh, fulfilling uh, the, the original vision that they had. Senator Kunish. Uh, so, so I guess then my, again, my question is because that was done like back in the seventies, I believe, which is, you know, many years ago, uh, would would it be required to do an EIS? I mean, we things have really changed, and now that 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 um, dam has been sitting there with all of that water or whatever else is in there, um, you know, knowing what we know now, what we didn't know then, um, is it would it make perfect sense to have that that environmental review redone? at this time before any kind of permits or expansion is allowed? Mr. Henderson. Senator and Chair, that is exactly something we're looking at right now. Okay. okay. We're doing what's called an environmental needs determination. And we are looking at exactly what the EIS covered, exactly what the new proposal is, and what may have changed that would we need to consider. Thank you, that, that's all I've got for right now. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Senator Kunish. Uh, Senator Tomasoni. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, thank you, Mr. Henderson, for your presentation. Um, what, what, you have, what you have shown the committee is 
how comprehensive the permitting process is in Minnesota, and it's probably the most comprehensive permitting process in the entire country. And um, I think that even though you did a really good job of showing everybody what has to be done in order to get a permit, you have absolutely no idea what everybody goes through in order to actually go out and get these permits and how much work has to be done. And if you just take into, into consideration the fact that Polymet's been doing it for over 15 years and that um, over $450 million has been spent to try and figure out exactly what's gonna happen is an indication of how comprehensive our permitting process really is and uh, how many steps are actually gone through in order to make sure that everything is done correctly. And, um, and so that's, that's just a, an example of how, how, um, how hard everybody worked at it, not, not just the agencies, but, but I, I believe I was at four or five different public meetings testifying and I know there were a lot of other people doing exactly the same thing and there were comments submitted and the agencies have to go through all the comments and they have to reply to all the comments. And in the end, uh, they issued the permits because they realized that this is a mining process that we can do safely and we can do without harm to the environment. And, um, and, and the other thing that was talked about is reclamation. And uh, just for Senator Isaacson, because it was a good question, we are constantly reclaiming old mine dumps and old mining operations. And in fact, if you drive between Hibbing and Chisholm, there's, there's all kinds of um, overburden from old mining dumps that you won't even know are there because they're completely covered with vegetation. And, and so the, the, the fact of the matter is that there's, we passed laws for the iron mining industry to have to reclaim their their uh, their dumps and make sure that the, as as they're as they're mining, that reclamation is happening. And on top of it, several cities on the Iron Range get their water from old pits that have filled up with water that are no longer being mined. And so the water that we're getting from these pits is also very 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 clean. And I, I should also point out to one of the I, I'm not sure if what you said, Senator Isaacson, was um, um, a comment on streams flowing into these into these uh, tailings ponds, or if you were just imagining that there was a dam and that streams were going into them. But what what's happening with these ring dikes that uh, that uh, Mr. Anderson pointed out is that they're filling with water that's coming out of the plant but they're also reclaiming the water and reusing the water and it's going back into the plant. So it's constantly being re reused. And part of the mining operation is to make sure that the dam keeps, keeps or, the, or the ring that keeps getting bigger and, and more robust and so that, so nothing happens. And, uh, and so, so we have a, we have a really, really good process in place. And in fact, after over 140 years of mining, we know how to do it really well. Um, the EQB actually did a, did a report card uh, on, on all the waters of the state. And the only place in the entire state that has clean water is northeastern Minnesota. So we, we know what we're doing. But one question to Mr. Henderson that maybe needs clarification is you pointed out that you're looking at a dam for twin metals but I think Twin Metals has committed to dry stack storage. So I don't believe there'll be any kind of a ring dike or, dike or dam at Twin Metals because of that. Is that correct, Mr. Henderson? Mr. Henderson. Thank you, Chair and Senator Thompsoni. I, I believe that they are still calling it a, a containment or a dam, even though you are correct, they have uh, proposed that they would be building a dry stack storage facility. Which would not be a dam. I would need to, I'm sorry, I would need Senator to look Henderson. at Henderson. Thank you. Done. I, I, I believe we'll be looking at the definition of a dam, but you are correct. It's a dry stack facility that they're proposing. Yeah, because dry stack says there's no water in it. <laughs> correct? That is correct. Did you have any additional questions, Senator Thomas? Only? Done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Uh, Senator Isaacson has his hand up again. I sent a, a question, uh, and I don't know if it's directed to uh, Senator Thomas Sony, and I don't want to demote Senator Henderson to the Senate, so I'm going to let him be at wherever he's at at the DNR. But uh, um, when we're reclaiming land 
and and I just am really trying to understand because uh, I don't know the science behind it, and I'm not sure how it works with. I've heard tailings are obviously pretty toxic, and there's a reason why we hold them together. But to what level, when you reclaim land, what does that mean compared to like? I, I imagine you guys have some sort of rubric or something in mind where you're like, if the original state was 100 percent, right? If that's and that might be a totally inappropriate way to explain it, but in my mind it might work like this: is 100 percent. How close do you get back to where it was? You know, because I imagine there's some things that are hard to get rid of, and other things you can kind of you know bring back and you know, like how close can you get back to a state of nature, so to speak, that that reflects where it was, that's safe to be? Because I like, you know, like, and and and, and Senator Kunish is exactly right. We have this uh, this this uh, armory over here. We used to have it, uh, TCAP, and it, they're finding new stuff. It seems like every day in the ground. And I don't know. They are talking about how difficult it is. And I'm not saying an armament factory and mining is the same, but I'm just interested in like what level can you get there, back to where it was when you are doing reclamation. Thank Mr. you for Anderson. the next question. Thank you, uh, Chair, Senator Isaacson. So if you were to drive, I, I don't disagree with Senator Tomasoni. Certain stockpiles and other things, we've planted trees. Other historic tailings basins, like I showed you the picture at the old LTV tailings basin, no trees are, are, are planted on that, and it's kept almost like in a prairie situation. It's remarkable, and again, and if we could take you up there someday and drive you around like Senator Tomasoni and others have been, um, you know, there's people that, in, that come and bird watch. There's beehives. There's, you know, things like that that um, actually thrive in those uh, tailings basins because of the lack of trees, but of uh, the diversity of, of you know the uh, the grasses and and the plants that that still live there. So uh, you know I, I would argue if you went to UTAC on one of their closed cells, they took uh, you know and and reclaimed one of the cells. They're harvesting hay on top of the tailings basin right now, and uh, you can see at any point in time if you look at pictures large round bales of hay being harvested on top of what was a historic tailings basin. Did I answer the question, Senator Isaac? Kind of. I mean, so it's not a matter of bringing it back to where it was. It's bringing it to a way in which we find to be acceptable, whatever that measurement might be determined by the DNR or the Senate or whoever, right? Is that kind of what you're saying? Then it's bringing you back to like an area that we find to be an okay area. And I'm not trying to, I'm not criticizing. I literally don't know. That's why I'm asking. I'm just trying to get, because in my mind, I would think as a novice person of this, if I'm reclaiming land, I'm bringing it back to where it was. And that's, that's not necessarily the case. I think Senator Tomasoni, did you have to this point? Sure. Whoever has it, that'd be great. Oh, you got to understand that they're digging great big holes in the ground and, and, and producing 40 million tons of taconate a year, which has which is the product that comes out after they've mined much more than that. So what the mining companies tell us is they tell us to make any law you want about what we do with our overburden. Just make us move it once because you can't move it a second time. So once they put them in the dumps, then we require them to reclaim the dumps so that the dumps are, are, are reclaimed. In the, in the case of polymeth and in the case of twin metals, they are actually going to put stuff back into the pits and, and um, get them back to the original uh, uh, what you're asking. And so um, it's the reason that uh, we have so many pits across the Iron Range where Chisholm gets their water out of, out of an open pit, uh, Hibbing gets it out of a well that's next, next to a pit, Virginia gets their water out of a pit, the Aurora up by lakes. I mean, it, the, the, the water that's coming is coming up from under the ground and filling up the pits. And so, so, the, so the water's clean and the pits have and if you come into my office someday when we're over here in session, you can see a reclaimed pit that is now uh, the, uh, uh, the the quarry golf course up in up in up at Giants Ridge. And so there's there's all kinds of things that have done to make sure that uh, it can be reused and, uh, and and it can be pristine. And and it's very very beautiful. In fact, when when the uh, trees change color in the fall and I'm driving from Hibbing to Chisholm, I stop and take a picture of the dump every single year because it's so beautiful because it's been reclaimed. That answer for you, Senator Isaacson? All right, we, we've had, I'm gonna ask just a couple questions for you, Mr. Henderson, short ones. We, we went a little longer than we probably should have, but the discussion has been very good and I think very educational for members. I see others shaking their heads. Um, 
you had kind of said that you guys work with uh, other state and federal agencies. We know you obviously work with the PCA. Um, that's why we have them here. People think of DNR and PCA as doing most of the permitting, but it's my understanding that there are several other agencies that usually get involved in permitting. Obviously they're doing their own work on it, but you guys sometimes work in conjunction with them. Um, who do you guys work with? I mean, how many other agencies? I know there are some from both the state and the federal level. And then from the DNR perspective, how many people do you guys have dedicated to do like mine permitting, even if it's just at the lands and vision, that's fine. I'm just trying to get a sense of how many people we employ at the state to do this, this work you guys do. Sure. Uh, Chairman Icorn. Um, so we work with, as pointed out, uh, Department of Health periodically. We work with the PCA, you know, quite a bit. We work with the tribal governments. And then on a federal level, you know, we always are, are uh, working potentially with the Bureau of Land Management, with the Forest Service, with, you know, Chippewa and Superior, um, with uh, uh, federal parks also, with Voyagers and, and, and uh, uh, others. Our group is not large, though. Between water permitting and, and permit to mine staff, uh, I would take a guess, you know, we're in a hiring freeze and we're down a few staff, but uh, we may have 10 staff in our whole program. Okay, thank you for those answers. I do, I do have other questions, but I think um, we'll continue on. Uh, we want to definitely give the Pollution Control Agency time to testify as well, because they do a lot of work in this realm as well. So I think we'll, we'll move over to them. If, if you're able to stick around, Mr. Henderson, please do. Uh, there might be questions that arise between now and the end of the end of the hearing. And I see Ms. Gauthier from the PCA put her camera on. So I assume it's going to be you that's uh, testifying for the agency on that side. And just go ahead and state your name for the record, even though we are are, and go ahead and get started. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Greta Gauthier, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Actually, I'm going to turn it over to Doug Wettstein, who is one of our division directors. He heads up our industrial division, which does permitting for many industries, including mining. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Doug. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, good afternoon. Uh, Doug Wettstein, Industrial Division Director at the MPCA. Uh, can everybody hear me and see me? And then we'll have some slides up shortly. We can see and hear you. Okay, good, thank you. I'll be presenting an overview of MPCA issued permits for metallic mining facilities, as well as some of the key issues and challenges. Uh, next slide. Uh, there we go. Uh, next slide, please. We see your slides now. Uh, this is just our mission statement, uh, protect and improve the environment and human health. Next slide. Uh, the MPCA implements both state and federal environmental laws in Minnesota. We have delegation basically to issue air and water permits. Uh, mining facilities need these same permits, just like any other industry sector. They have this comply with the same standards and go through the same administrative processes uh, for acquiring permits. There may, however, be certain requirements specific to mining. An example would be tailings basin management where they're required to uh, periodically uh, look for seeps, um, keep a certain volume of tailings on hand to do proper closure, and then fugitive dust emissions from exposed areas. Next slide, please. These are just some of the types of permits that may be required for mining facilities. Um, air emissions permits, uh, wastewater discharge permits, both state and federal. Um, stormwater construction and industrial permits, uh, wetlands impacts, uh, 401 certification, potentially a solid waste permit, uh, hazardous waste uh, generators licenses, depending upon uh, the volume of waste that's generated in a calendar month, and then above and below ground storage tanks. Next slide, please. Uh, national uh, ambient air quality standards, uh, apply uh, to these facilities, the large ones. Um, periodically, the EPA updates uh, these standards. An example of that would be particulate matter uh, has been decreased over time from a, a, a particulate matter of 10 microns down to 2.5. Uh, 
uh, regional haze. This is visibility related to national parks and wilderness areas, uh, basically visibility. It's a federally administered program. Fugitive dust, as I mentioned before, essentially windblown dust. Uh, climate change and greenhouse gases. Uh, we're currently determining uh, appropriate paths forward. And then lastly, mercury. Um, as you're potentially aware, uh, there is a statewide mercury TMDL or total maximum daily load. There's a goal of 789 pounds by the year 2025. We're making good progress uh, in the energy sector and in removing mercury from products. Uh, but there is a goal needed to meet um, that's a 72% reduction in the taconite industry. And each, industry, each facility has submitted a mercury reduction plan and we continue to work with the industry to achieve uh, those reduction goals. Next slide, please. The MPCA has a joint construction and operating permitting program. Basically, we do not issue separate permits for construction and then another permit for operating like some states do. Uh, the federal Title V or Part 70 permit um, is required for emissions of any one criteria pollutant of over 100 tons per year. Uh, it's a federal operating permit, as I mentioned, required by the Clean Air Act, issued by the state of Minnesota. It sets requirements on operation, monitoring, and reporting. And it's a five-year permit term that must be reissued thereafter. Uh, it can be administratively extended beyond that five-year period if they reapply and there's been no change in the operation. Uh, new construction. Uh, adds a part to the permit under the Federal Clean Air Act. Um, it's um, what we call new source review or prevention of significant deterioration. It's essentially required when, product, when projects involve, like I said, new construction. And it's an assessment upfront review uh, to determine proposed projects ability to comply with existing air quality standards. It's primary, primarily modeling and a technology review. Uh, that that goes through that that the facility goes through. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, state only uh, permits for air. Um, again, we do not separate construction from operating. Uh, it's it's one permit. It's authorized by Minnesota rules. It may be applicable to projects with lower air emissions, such as scram mining. Uh, these are called individual permits or registration permits, and these are usually very low emissions. We're talking hundreds of pounds versus tons per year of criteria pollutants. Um, and these permits do not expire unless there's a change in the operation. Next slide, please. So the process for acquiring an air quality permit, uh, they must be obtained prior to construction. There are some things that are allowed uh, ahead of acquiring a permit, but it's very limited. Uh, usually it's just clearing and grubbing, uh, initiating of contracts, and stockpiling of materials. Uh, but no permanent structures such as footings uh, can be built. Uh, the application goes through a completeness review and permit drafting. Uh, this will vary six to 12 months or more, depending upon how complicated it is. Uh, issues that have to be resolved, sort of that back and forth that occurs between the MPCA and the facility and their consultants. Uh, once there's a, 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 a draft permit, it goes on pre-public notice review, first by the tribes per a memorandum of understanding and the company or the permittee. Uh, usually that's a two week period. It then goes uh, on public notice public comment period, which is a required 30 days. Uh, then there's this, we have to respond to those comments and that will vary depending upon uh, the questions and the comments that we've received. Uh, once we draft that all up, uh, the permit is then sent to the US EPA for their review. They have 45 days to complete that. Uh, if there's any edits, changes, comments, uh, things that have to be done. Uh, it potentially could go back on public notice, but the permit is issued uh, with 
The fact being that there's a it, the decision could be open to a legal challenge for up to 60 days. Next slide, please. Uh, key wastewater issues for mining, uh, sulfate. Uh, sorry, whoop, looks like the order's changed on me here. I'll, uh, class three and four uh, standards. Uh, essentially, um, this is currently going through a rule revision, uh, but uh, currently uh, the use, whether it's industrial, agriculture, or wildlife, determines whether it's class three or four. Three or four. And like I said, this is currently going through a, a rule revision. Uh, sulfate. Um, wild rice, uh, there's a current uh, 10 milligrams per liter standard. Uh, there is a little bit of a conflict with session law from uh, 2015. Uh, a rulemaking effort was required. It was initiated, but it has not been finalized. Um, but essentially, the MPCA cannot put a sulfate limit in a permit or force a, a facility or company to spend money to comply with a sulfate limit. Uh, mercury. Um, the issue here is sulfate reducing bacteria causes mercury methylation, which results in fish advisories that are issued. Uh, again, this ties back to the statewide mercury TMDL. And uh, lastly is anti-degradation. Uh, we don't want newer expanding discharges to make things worse. We want to protect higher quality waters and to uh, keep them high quality. Uh, next slide, please. Wastewater discharge permits. Essentially, there's two. The Federal uh, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES permit. It's a federal permit required by the Clean Water Act. It's issued by the MPCA. The key here is that it authorizes wastewater discharges to surface waters. Uh, it includes effluent limits and other requirements to protect water quality standards. And it's a five-year permit term that must be reissued thereafter. However, expired permits can, uh, the facilities can keep operating if they reapply and there are no changes in the operation. State disposal system or SDS permits or a state permit required by Minnesota rule. Uh, it authorizes operation of wastewater disposal systems and discharges to groundwater, uh, potentially irrigation or infiltration as well. Uh, they're usually uh, issued together, an SDS permit with an NPDS permit. Uh, but if you have an NPDS permit, you will also be issued an SDS permit. Again, it's for the part of the system that's the infrastructure. And it's a four, or a, excuse me, a five to 10 year permit term that has to be reissued thereafter. Uh, next slide, please. The process, uh, submittal of a permit application within 180 days prior to expiration or uh, a new discharge. Uh, there's an application review and permit drafting Again, it's variable as to how long that takes, anywhere from three to 12 months, uh, depending upon how much back and forth there is and the issues that need to be resolved. Again, a pre-public notice review by the tribes and the permittee uh, for two weeks. Uh, then it would go on public notice, public comment period for 30 days. Uh, the response to public comments is gonna vary depending upon the number received and uh, the types of questions, comments that we get. EPA reviews these permits throughout the entire process, uh, but they only review the NPDES permits, not the state disposal system permits. Um, then the permit would be issued. Uh, again, it's open to legal challenge for up to 60 days. Next slide, please. Uh, stormwater discharge permits. Uh, there's an industrial stormwater multi-sector general permit that uh, regulates uh, stormwater from based on an industry sector. It's a general permit with requirements that are applicable basically to, to all the facilities within that sector. Uh, requires benchmark monitoring and a pollution, or excuse me, a stormwater pollution prevention plan. Uh, stormwater requirements though can be included in an individual NPDES permit uh, which would then negate the need to have a separate uh, 
general uh, industrial stormwater permit. Coverage is effective within three days after submittal of a complete application. And this is an online service. Uh, it's relatively new, but it does uh, make things more efficient and speeds things up. Next slide, please. Uh, construction stormwater general permit. Uh, this regulates stormwater from construction activities. It's required when there's more than one acre of land uh, disturbing activities. It's a general permit with requirements that are applicable to all facilities. Uh, requires best management practices. And again, a stormwater pollution prevention plan. The coverage is effective within three days after submittal of a complete application. Uh, it may take up to 30 days review though for larger or more complex projects, uh, just because uh, staff have to have the time to look it over. And it's an online service as well. So it has uh, greatly increased uh, efficiency. Next slide, please. And I believe uh, Dave Benke from the MPCA is gonna talk about 401 certification. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Just state your name for the record and please continue. My name is David Benke. I'm the director of our resource management and assistance division at the Pollution Control Agency. I just want to take a couple minutes to talk about the 401 certification and the 404 permits. Um, the 401 certification program is created in the Clean Water Act. Uh, it's actually part of the act and 401 refers to the section of the act where it can be found. It's there to help states and authorized tribes uh, to ensure that federally permitted or licensed projects won't cause a violation of the state's or tribe's water quality standards. Uh, those water quality standards are themselves created uh, by the Clean Water Act and are typically set by either the state or the authorized tribe. Uh, in Minnesota, we set those standards, but they're ultimately approved by the EPA. Uh, most 401 certifications are associated with what are the Section 404 permits. Those 404 permits uh, are those dredge and fill permits that are typically administered by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, so the focus of the MPCA's review and typical certification conditions are those that are appropriate to address the water quality uh, impacts. Uh, that physical alteration has impacts and we typically certify conditions for the avoidance and minimization of the impacts, um, the mitigation for unfavorable impacts, and the monitoring if we need to, uh, to ensure that the hydrology isn't impacted in a way that would lead to more impacts later on. We also ensure that any temporarily impacted streams and wetlands are properly restored uh, at the end of the uh, project or the segment of the project. As far as the timeline goes, you know, the Clean Water Act requires that a 401 certification a decision occur within a reasonable period of time um, as determined by the federal permitting agency. And in this case, it's generally the Army Corps of Engineers uh, and the Current regulations with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, have a 60 day as the standard time period, uh, unless the justification can be for a longer period based on project size or complexity. Um, the 401 certification decision can in no uh, way be extended beyond a year. So it's somewhere between the 60 day and the year. As you're aware, that mining projects are typically those that are larger and more complex. So our most recent uh, decisions are probably more in the time frame of 150 to 180 days, um, about five or six months. Um, and that's when their decisions are coming in. So that's probably the most viable time frame right now for a 401 certification uh, for most mining projects right now. It was already mentioned that some of the water quality standards and associated requirements overlap. Uh, we work hard with the other regulatory agencies make sure that we collaborate on the mining projects to ensure that we get a consistent and high quality level of review for those overlapping issues. So that's kind of 401 certification uh, in a nutshell. Mr. Chairman, Greta Gothier, PCA. With that, it concludes our testimony and um, Doug and Dave, the rest, and we are here to answer questions that your members may have. And thank you for the opportunity. Perfect. We'll open it up for some member questions first. If any members have any questions. 
not seeing any members with hands raised. So I'll, I'll kind of ask a couple here. I've got, want to kind of ask you the same thing that I asked the DNR folks. And um, I know you guys work obviously in conjunction with the DNR on some of this permitting, but you also work with other state agencies and you work with uh, federal agencies as well. Can you kind of lay out a little bit what that looks like? How many agencies uh, really end up involved in actually permitting something like this, whether it be ferrous or non-ferrous? And then how many people approximately, just an approximate is fine, uh, working at the Pollution Control Agency do you, are employed kind of to do this mine permitting stuff? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Doug Wettstein. Um, well, the, the main um, uh, governmental unit that we do work with, obviously, is the US EPA, specifically Region 5 out of Chicago, uh, US Army Corps of Engineers on the uh, 401 certification, 404 uh, permit process. Uh, occasionally, uh, we have to interact with the Department of Health and uh, certainly the DNR, uh, but those are the primary players. Um, as far as number of employees, uh, we have a uh, mining unit. Uh, there are four, uh, I think counting the supervisor, there's four people um, that work full time. And then we pull in some people occasionally to, uh, to um, uh, uh, provide certain technical expertise. Um, and I neglected to mention the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, is another uh, federal government agency that we do uh, interact with. The, the total number of staff, I suppose, when you add up all the full time and then the pieces of part of people's time is probably six to eight FTEs on a, a regular basis. Okay, thank you. I see Senator Kunish has her hand up and then Senator Tomasoni. Thank you once again, Chair, and thank you for um, all of you who are providing this wealth of information for us. Uh, my one question is, um, and I don't know which one of the agencies would would re would reply to this, but does um, our does Minnesota law allow you to permit a mine that um, discharges pollutants at levels greater than um, than the receiving water and and air. Ms. Gauthier, or did you have somebody at your agency want to respond to that or? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think I'll see, Doug, do you want to take, or Katrina? Let's have Katrina Kessler respond to that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Kessler. Mr. Chair and Senator Kunish, thanks for the question. I'm Katrina Kessler. I'm one of the assistant commissioners at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency with oversight for water policy and agriculture. And to the question as to whether or not we can permit projects that um, exceed standards, which I believe to be the, the question. So uh, uh, Mr. Wettstein walked through the process at a high level. And one of the things that he mentioned was anti-degradation. And that's a key component of both the Clean Water Act and state regulations when you think about how we review permit applications, consider projects, and ultimately go forward to our permitting process. And what that requires is that we look at the existing water quality where a facility is, is proposed to discharge, whether that's a stream or a lake or a wetland. And then we look at what is likely to come out of a discharge pipe. And if the, if the um, pipe's quality of effluent or discharge to that receiving water is going to degrade it in any way. There is an analysis that's done, a cost benefit analysis, and only can degradation occur um, if there is a benefit that outweighs the degradation and never can a discharge degrade a water such that it no longer meets water quality standards. So we cannot permit a new discharge that would exceed a phosphorus standard or, or would exceed a salty parameter standard. And we can only allow that degradation to that standard in the event that the degradation is justified by important social and economic um, criteria. Follow up? Senator Kunish? Well, so what, under what circumstances would, would that be allowed? Uh, I mean, how would, 
the discharge improve the air or the water? Um, is there an example of that? Kessler? Um, Mr. Chair and Senator Kunish. So how this works is um, a facility has to submit an application and include it in that application in order for us to complete this analysis is the technology that they plan to use to meet the conditions in their permit, which are protective of those downstream water quality standards. So the example that I will give is the, the recently worked on PolyMet permit that the agency issued. So in that case, through iterative back and forth with the agency, the proposal changed such that the PolyMet project installed and um, is going to build a nanotechnology and reverse osmosis filtration system so that the water coming out of their discharge pipe, essentially that's the same type of technology that's used at drinking water plants. So the anti-degradation process in that instance worked because through the iterative review of what they were proposing versus the standards, they, we ultimately got to a level that would not degrade at all and would actually improve the water quality for certain parameters. Okay, um, thank you. And just, just one more question. If you would go back to the sulfite and wild rice slide, and I forget what slide number that was. There was, um, if you could just explain that a little bit uh, better for me. Um, let's see. Mr. Chairman, we'll have that up in just a minute. Okay. Thank you. Trying to find it here too. Um, I guess I was sort of curious uh, if you could just explain that a little bit uh, more to me. Trying to find it. There, uh, can you see that Mr. Chairman and members? Yes, we can see it on the screen now. Thank you. Greg. Yeah. Great. I'm going to let, let Katrina Kessler talk about that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Kessler? Oh, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Kunish. So the second bullet or the second bolded text there calls out sulfate. And um, as the delegated authority for the Clean Water Act in Minnesota, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is responsible for implementing EPA approved water quality standards. And one of those water quality standards, which was adopted in the late 60s, early 70s, is a water quality standard that protects wild rice from sulfate. When um, the research was developed on that standard, it showed that when sulfate was greater than 10 milligrams per liter, there was a negative impact on wild rice health. So that's the water quality standard that is in effect, that is approved by the EPA and that we are tasked with implementing under the Clean Water Act. In 2015, in recognition that there was a desire to reevaluate the science around that standard, a state session law was passed that directed the MPCA not to implement that EPA approved water quality standard into permits in ways that would require permit holders to spend money or to list waters as impaired on our every two years assessment activity that is also required by the clean water called the impaired waters list. So the 2015 state session law prohibits the MPCA from implementing that EPA approved water quality standard. And at the time that law made a lot of sense because the MPCA with the benefit of resources from the legislature was going through a rulemaking process to look at what new science said about impacts from sulfate on wild rice. And as Mr. Wettstein noted in his presentation, ultimately that rulemaking did not come to fruition. And as a result, we still have this EPA approved 10 milligram per liter sulfate water quality standard that we as the Clean Water Act delegated authority are supposed to implement and we have this session law that says we cannot implement it. So that is a, a significant challenge for the agency. Senator so, Kunish. Uh, so has has there ever been legislation to to correct that that um, that issue? The you know, you're kind of 
damned if you do or damned if you don't is is there has there ever been legislation to correct that miss kessler mr chair and senator kunish not that i am aware of thank you senator thomas oni thank you thank you mr chairman so um my initial comments were are just to point out and i want to thank you mr chairman for having this hearing that uh, we just heard from the DNR and the MPCA today, but we did hear cross-references to other agencies, the Army Corps of Engineers, the federal EPA, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the U.S. Forestry Service. I, I'm missing one because I know there were seven different agencies that were involved in permitting for, for polymath, and 20 different permits were issued because of all of the, uh, the rigorous uh, rules that are, there are in Minnesota for this, and it's an indication of of what we have to go through in order to actually permit a mine, and I'm uh, I, I I just want I just want the rest of the committee members, the people listening, to understand that when we go through a permitting process, it's extremely extremely extensive. As to wild rice, let's uh, let's be pretty clear about this. Um, the uh, the 10 standard was developed somewhere back in 1942 by some guy paddling around in southern Minnesota, and he came up with a, a standard that might be 10, might be 50. He wasn't sure. In fact, they even asked him uh, when, when, they, when they promulgated the rule, uh, what should it be? And he said, I don't know, 50, 10, make, make it 10. So they made it 10 back in 1973. And the reason the EPA put it in rule is because the EPA just took all the rules that were in, in effect at the time in every state and put them into the Clean Water Act. Now, there have been all kinds of testing that has gone on. And we have had uh, significant testing that said, you know, it might be 10, it might be 100, it might be 500, and it might be as high as 2,500. And they have shown that wild rice grows in all of those situations in different places. And they also have shown that even if it is 10, that if you're in Northern Minnesota, because there's iron in the water, it mitigates the conversion of sulfate to sulfide, which is what the problem becomes. And so, so for us to say that 10 is the answer and to potentially shut down uh, a Kiwat and Taconite or a Mintac because of it, because they'd have to spend $250 million to mitigate whatever it is that they're trying to do is, is a real, real problem. And so for, and, and, and the other thing we know is last summer there was a bumper crop of wild rice. So it's not as if the wild rice is being harmed right now, number one. And number two, the things we know about wild rice is that wild rice grows in perfect conditions. And, and, it, and it's seasonal in that some seasons it doesn't grow very well and some seasons it grows really well. And a lot of it depends on whether or not the, the water depth is correct. If the water depth is too low, the wild rice doesn't grow well. If the, wild, if the water depth is too high, the wild rice doesn't grow very well. And if the temperature of the water isn't correct, the wild rice might not grow well. So there's a lot of factors that are way more significant than the sulfate. And the fact of the matter is, I don't think we've proven to a, with beyond a reasonable doubt that 10 is the number. And for us to be putting it into permits and potentially shutting down people's jobs and finding out that right downstream from the, the places where, where we're, we're thinking about um, these, these standards, wild rice is growing and it's growing very abundantly. So there, there's, there's, there's a lot of, lot of, lot of science left out in the, I don't think the jury's, the jury's made a decision yet on, on sulfate. Thank you, Senator Tomasoni. And I, I do have uh, one other person uh, that is gonna add some context to the discussion here. We've had a lot of good discussion and we invited uh, some folks from industry to listen in as well, because obviously they're affected by some of the permits uh, we had Frank Ongaro testify before he's with Mining Minnesota, and he messaged me and said he might be able to add some context to some of the questions that members had previously. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Frank. Just go ahead and state your name for the record, and uh, please add to the conversation. It's good to have you, Frank. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, Frank Ongaro, uh, Executive Director of Mining Minnesota. Um, I'll real quickly just uh, uh, touch on a couple of the uh, uh, questions uh, uh, that were asked. Um, obviously, you heard about the uh, comprehensive environmental review and permitting process could have heard 
all day about environmental review and even more about permitting. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say, every company, again, going through that's gonna have to demonstrate they can meet all air and water quality standards if their project's gonna move forward. Uh, there was some question about uh, public comment uh, periods and hearings and whether those were adequate and some were did or did not happen. Uh, keep in mind, uh, using a polymet example, I don't know of anyone who didn't have an opportunity on several occasions to provide input on environmental review and permitting at hearings and public comment. It may not always been the hearing uh, someone wants, but that's what the courts are for with uh, a contested case hearing. Uh, we talked, uh, we, I heard some questions about financial assurance. And um, I think Mr. Uh, Henderson did a very good job of uh, talking about how the taxpayer uh, is protected. Uh, but uh, uh, wanted to point out that, you know, the comprehensive rules that all stakeholders, all parties helped in the process, put into place and pass into rules 37 pages are comprehensive, they're descriptive and prescriptive and require every imaginable level of protection for financial assurance to make sure the taxpayer is protected. I heard some interesting conversation about dams, um, you know, the Polymet uh, project. I don't, can't think of a, a, a dam in the world uh, that has ever had more review and analysis uh, than uh, that project and make no mistake, the Twin Metals proposal will have no basin, no dam. Um, I heard some questions about health impact assessment. Again, under the make no mistake category, health impacts were assessed in the environmental review process of the PolyMet project. Um, I, think, uh, I think that covers most of um, what uh, what came up uh, in questions, uh, I saw a comment about mercury, just so everyone knows, if you look at uh, the environmental review and permitting process for PolyMet, uh, keep in mind the PolyMet project will result in an overall reduction in mercury. Important things to always keep in mind that don't always uh, uh, get flushed out uh, in conversation. And certainly over the last handful of years, uh, there's been several pieces of legislation uh, that have spoken to uh, sulfate uh, and the sulfate level um, that is uh, currently being discussed uh, at the agency and, and the legislative uh, session. I see Senator Eichhorn even has uh, another bill this year on the uh, Stewardship Council. So uh, again, uh, environmental review, you heard a lot, uh, keeping in mind that's not a decision document. It assesses impacts and proposes mitigation that a company has to demonstrate will result basically in, in what's a Fonzi, a, a finding of no significant impact if a project's gonna move forward and every project has to demonstrate that if it does. That's uh, all I have, Mr. Chairman, on comments related to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Angaro, for adding those comments. Uh, we only got a minute or two left. I did wanna get one more question in. Uh, for Ms. Gauthier, maybe uh, uh, Mr. Henderson from the DNR could give me a thumbs up on it as well. As you guys are doing these permitting, obviously you go through a ton of science to do these. It's not just it's not just a, a decision you make. You also go through the public comment period. Um, how is that kind of weighted out? Is it is it weighted more on science? Is it weighted more on public comment? Can you kind of touch on that a little bit? I assume, my assumption is that it's probably based on what the science and data tells you more than anything, but if you could just touch on that and um, if you agree, Joe, just give us a thumbs up and that's good enough because we're pretty much out of time. Greta? So Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. I'll be brief. Our work is based on the science. However, we do take into account the comments, especially around implementation. Um, so we do respond to every single comment. We are required to do that in chapter 14. And we will look at the comments in terms of, you know, pathways, especially if it's a, um, a municipality, maybe pathways to ease uh, implementation. But the, the guts of the water quality standard is built on science. Thank you, Ms. Gauthier. Uh, Mr. Henderson, I think that's more than a thumbs up. If you want to touch on it, we, we got one more minute if you want to touch on that. Uh, 
Chairman Senators, I, I, that is correct. It's we too at the DNR are founded in the science. We too consider all comments and, and look at how they might be able to better a project. And also matching that with what are the true legal requirements uh, within the state of Minnesota. And, and so matching the science to the legal requirements and considering all comments, that's how you do it. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. And thank, thank you to the DNR and thank you to the Pollution Control Agency. This I think was a great discussion today, great questions from members. Um, I think it was really educational for all of us, even those of us like me who already have a, a a pretty good understanding of what of what goes on. So we appreciate the testimony today. Um, you know, I, I think we definitely heard that you guys do a lot of work and you guys definitely make these companies prove it before they can start mining or doing what they're gonna do. I mean, you, you really put them through the ringer. We really have one of the most comprehensive processes, I would argue, probably in the world. So thank you for the hard work you do and, and helping to keep our environment safe and doing the work you do. And, making those companies prove it first. So that's one of the things I just, just wanted to touch on. Thank you for the hearing today. I wish we had more time to talk about it. As Senator Tomasoni said, we could probably, you know, have a whole day's worth of hearing on from probably each agency and some of the federal folks as well. So maybe we'll touch more on it in the future. And it was mentioned a couple of times by Mr. Henderson, maybe we could get up there. We are still planning to try to do that this summer and get members up there. And um, one of the things we want to do is help, help educate members on, on what it is we do in Northeastern Minnesota and how we do it well. So uh, certainly the DNR and the PCA are part of that. So thanks for a great hearing today, guys. Uh, with that, we are adjourned.